Okay, Let, let's begin. Um, so tonight we're going to go through. Uh, we're going to we're going to go through uh, one of the keynote. We're going to go through keynote number seven. The second one that we say in the morning. It's uh it starts with Eha at the uh the app the app. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna I have the uh this, you know if you don't have this one it's very good. It's edition of the keynote. It's with the Rose commentary. Um, I think it was made fairly recently, and we're going to take a look at how how the Rev explains. We're going to go through it slowly. I don't know if we're going to get through the entire through the entire Tina, um, because it's very deep. Um, you know, I wasn't I was I, I wasn't alive at the time, but I think they say that the Rev on Tisha B'Av he would basically just read the keynotes and explain all of them for like hours and hours and hours, um, and you know. He had a lot to say, so I, I guess they had enough to compile uh, compile this book with with the rough commentary. So we're gonna we're gonna benefit from that and and read it, and hopefully it'll give us uh, some more more depth to when uh, we say the keynote ourselves. You know, you can't you can't do them all, and um, and you might not, we may not even be able to do the whole thing, but we do what we can every single year, do a little, a little bit more until the base makes it built. Um, and then maybe we won't need to say the keynote anymore. So I'll, I I can read it. Um, I'm going to read it, and I guess if you, if you want to pull up the text, you can follow it along. Um, but it's it's but it's but uh it will go slowly, so so it should be clear. So the first the first the first paragraph says, How could you rush your rest? Le'abed biyad adumim emunecha, ruining your loyal people at the hands of Rome. Adumim adumim be translating as Rome. Below is the heart of Brit ben ben pesarim. Asher beyarta lifunecha, and not remember the covenant of of your. You not remember your covenant with Abraham, who met the challenges of. Your trials, the chaim bitinu. So we exclaim, the chor Hashem mehayalanu. Remember Hashem, what has happened to us. So that's the first phrase. We're gonna read. So now, now let's look at the now. Now we're gonna go through the rough commentary, and then we'll read it back because it's you know that's so hard to understand it even with the translation there. So let's see what the rough says. So so he says echa atzaviyat. How could you rush your rest? One could ask, what right do we have opposed to pose such a question to the Almighty? Right? Normally, the halacha is, doesn't permit us to ask this type of question. Rather, prescribes that we unquestionably accept the judgment of God. We are guided by the concept that a person is required to bless, bless God for bad times, for tragedy and misfortune, just as he blesses God for good times. The Gemara and says, and when comforted with tragedy, we do not argue with God. Rather, we say, blessed is the true judge, right? When someone, when someone dies, but we say, Baruch Dayan Hamet, blessed is the true judge. We do not understand misfortune because we have no right to expect that we will understand, right? You, you, we're, not, we're not allowed, we're not allowed in Halakha to question why it is that bad things happen because we can't understand the world. Yet, what are we doing here? The word eicha means how. How is a question. So says the Rav, the case of keynote on Tisha B'av, however, is an exception to the general rule. We are permitted to ask eicha because we are following the precedent of Jeremiah, the prophet who posed the question eicha in the book of Lamentations, eicha, which, which we're going to read on, on Wednesday night. And Jeremiah posed this question only because in, because he was given the hetzer. He had special permission by God Himself, who instructed him to write Eicha Yashva Vadad, the first sentence of the Book of Lamentations, the first sentence of Eicha. In effect, God granted a unique privilege to Jeremiah to address himself to God with these otherwise impermissible questions and to write keynote lamentations in the form of the Book of Eicha. The reason that God granted permission to express these otherwise inappropriate questions is that Jeremiah was expressing mourning for the destruction of the temple. His tragedy was so overwhelming that the prophet and anyone else was granted unlimited freedom to pose questions that would have been inappropriate 
under any other circumstances. Thus, Rabbi Al Azar Hakalir, Rabbi Al Azar Hakalir is the author of this of this of this uh, this pia. He says is permitted to address the question Eicha to God only because that question was already posed to God by Jeremiah in Lamentation. So again, normally we're not allowed to we're not allowed to question God. We're not allowed to say how, why is this happening? But here on Tisha B'av, specifically in this situation, we're allowed to ask Eicha. Um, and, and so now, and also then, then the rub gives us a, you know, just a, since we're talking about Eicha already, he, he gives us a, an outline of what Eicha is all about. He says, the book of Eicha consists of three sections. So when we read Eicha Wednesday night, remember this, the first section is comprised of chapters one and two, which essentially are keynote from which the prophet asks the question Eicha. He just says Eicha, Eicha in, over and over again in these first two chapters. Thus in the two chapters, the book of Eicha asserts that it's appropriate, right? Normally it's never appropriate, but here it's appropriate to pose the question we can ask Eicha because of the, right, just to, to again, to review why, because it's because of the, the unique tragedy, the, the, the overwhelming mourningness that we have, that there's nothing else we can do but feel Eicha. The next section in, of the book is chapter three. Says I am the man who has seen the affliction by the rod of his anger. And that chapter records the answer received by Jeremiah from God. The question posed in the first two chapters. So the so in the first two chapters we ask how, why, you know why, how how could this happen, God? Chapter three is the answer. The answer is tirakadin, the acknowledgement of the justness of God's ways and the fact that human beings are endowed with free will. With the beginning of this third chapter, though, the permission to, to ask Eicha has been revoked. Um, okay, so, and then the, the last section, he says, the Eicha consists of chapter four and five, which commences with the eulogy that Jeremiah delivered to the honor of King Josiah, the subject entire ki, the Kino, by Yochinen, Yermiao, Yeshaya. Okay. Um, it, also, I'll just mention that, that on Shabbat, I think it's appropriate to mention this because it's uh, from the Dudai Rubin, who's the grandfather of of their founder, the yeshiva, Zai Rubin. So I, I was looking at it on, on Shabbos and he spoke and he, he was writing about the word Eicha because he mentioned that we find the word Eicha basically in three three different places in Tanakh that we have it in in last week's Parsha, which was Devarim, which was said by Moshe Rabbeinu. And then we have it also in Yeshaya, um, said by Yeshaya, um, and that, that was actually in, I think, in the Haftorah of last week. And then we also have it here near Miyayu. So, so he, 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 you know, he was trying to understand the point. Why, why, why are these, these the three times that we, why we express Eicha? And he, his basic point was that, you know, Eicha is this word which, which expresses something which nor can't be expressed normally by other words. It's this, it's this feeling of, that's really beyond words. And that's why it was appropriate. And, you know, he said it's appropriate in, in, when, when B'nai Israel is the highest of high and also when they're at the lowest of low. So he said Moshe was using it in, in, in a situation where, you know, B'nai Israel were such at high level that he, he wouldn't be able to judge them on his own. So he said Eicha, but, you know, the, the, other, the other prophets, so we have Yirmiyahu, Especially is using Eicha in a time where where that's such a low and there's and there's no no other way to, to explain it. That was the idea from the Desai Rubin. Um, anyway, so continue continue with the with with the words of well, of it. So to ruining your loyal people at the hands of Rum. Right, just to re repeat the sentence. How could you rush your wrath? Right, we said Eicha is how this this word Eicha that we don't normally use. Ruining your loyal people at the hands of Israel. So says the Rav. The simple interpretation is that what does Adom mean? What does that word sound like? Ad Adom Edom. So he says Adomim. Says the simple interpretation is it refers to Edom, which is the Romans who were responsible for the destruction of the Second Temple. Romans identified with Edom in the Torah's recounting of the lineage of Esau. Who's referred to as Edom. Um, this the reference to Rome says the rub, however, should not be taken literally, but should be seen as a symbol for the most powerful of the nations of the world, 
Historically, the nation that opposed the Jews was always the most powerful nation of its time. In the days of Jeremiah, the Babylonian Empire was the most powerful nation. 500 years later, at the time of the Second Temple, this position was occupied by the Roman Empire. Um, I'll, I'll interrupt his commentary just to, just to mention another point that, that I heard this week. I was listening to the sherm from Rav Moshe Tarragon, who's um, giving shares on, he has, he has a whole series called The Long View of the Exile, which is that he's, you know, he's kind of taking, he's saying that it's, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's a little bit hard for us to relate to, you know, mourning the base of Mikdash. Like it's a, it's a, it's a building that, you know, obviously it's a very holy, it was very holy, but we, we never really experienced it. You know, what does it mean for us to you know, sit there and, and mourn the, the, the day that the uh, base of Mikdash was destroyed? Sometimes it's hard for us to, to get a good understanding of that. So, He's providing what he, he has a bunch of shears, which is like a, each like ten minutes, um, and and he's trying to, you know, put put the put the gullish, put the exile into 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 context and kind of go through the different history of of the of the exile. But what well, he made a point, he he made a point though, you know, he he's, he's first of all his his main his main point so far, which I'm which I'm getting at least is that. You know, the Gullus is the fact that we're in exile is, is something which has already been, um, you know, it's something almost, it's not, it's, it's, he doesn't want to say it's like inevitable because, you know, still we have free will, but it's something which, which is rooted already from, from the beginning of times from, from Avraham and, and Yitzhak and Yaakov. And it's, and, you know, it's this, it's this almost natural, natural thing that happened to us as, as Jewish people that we kind of get sent, we get sent away to a different land. And then, you know, how, how we, uh, how we, in, how we interact and how we still make an impact, even when, when we're sent, sent away. Um, but he, he said that it's, it's no, it's no accident though, that who are the, who are the ones that, that have sent us into both? Who are, who are the, who are the nations that have sent us into exile? It's been the most, been the most powerful nations, right? It's not, it's not like we've been, we've been exiled by these, small, small, you know, small nations, which just happened to get into a little conflict with us, right? They won the conflict, they sent us away. No, it was the, it was the biggest superpowers of the time, which are the ones that sent us into exile. There's, there's four, there's four goals. There's four different exiles that we have. There's Bavel, which is Babylon, Madai, um, like Persia, Yavan is Greece, and Edom is, is, uh, is the Romans, but it's, it was the biggest superpowers of the time who, who sent us into exile. Um, and, and it's, he says also, it's no mistake that, you know, how, how the reason why, the reason why we need to be sent in, sent to exile in that time, that the Jewish people, you know, the, the, the nation of morality are kind of the ones they standing up, standing up for ethics, standing up for morality against, you know, these, uh, different cultures, the different cultures throughout time, which brought, brought their own, brought their own, um, you know, my, different, different beliefs. So that's that was the, the same point that that the Rav is making here is that you know Rome shouldn't be taken literally, but it's you know it's that, that the nation that opposed the Jews is always the most powerful nation at the time. That's that's what the Rav says here. Also, also when we when we um, uh, just another point that we say about the, the 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 different exiles that we have, the you know the the ancestor, the the, the father of all those exiles. Is really the the exile of Mitzrayim, the the Gauls of Mitzrayim, which is which is listed and which is told in, in the Torah, and and you know we're supposed to I think we're supposed to learn the lessons from from the Gauls of Mitzrayim, and then ultimately from the fact that we were redeemed in in that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim and 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 redeemed us, and you know maybe that's also part you know we we spoke about this we spoke this, about this many times in our Tefillah share, you know what what is it so special about remembering the Tfilah Mitzrayim? So it could be also to remember, you know, that this is, you know, we, we've been sent into Gauls before, and ultimately, just as like Hashem redeemed us from Mitzrayim, He's gonna He's gonna redeem us also. He's gonna redeem us also from this Gauls. So, anyways, that um, he finished by saying Edom also refers to Amalek, the grandson of Esav. Amalek is not a racial or ethnic concept; rather, is the enemy, regardless of race or historical era, that seeks to destroy the Jews. It seeks to destroy the uniqueness. In the individual identity and spiritual personality of a Jew, 
the final Gaulus, the final exile, which will be terminated by the arrival of the Messiah, is the Gaulus caused by Amalek. As Rashi says, God's name and his throne will not be complete until the name of Amalek is erased. And then, and then we say, below is the heart of Greece, be now the term, and share be Rarka, leave Hunechva. So, what does that mean? This end. Right, so, again, so, it's, you know, now let's relate it back into this. You know, it's all, we're still in the first sentence. So, you know, the Rub had a lot to say. You can imagine, you can imagine these keynotes with the Rub. You know, if this is all one sentence, you can imagine each one would have taken a quite, quite a long time. They've been there for a while. But, anyways, so, just to put it into an uh, English sentence, how can you? That was the first sentence. How could you rush your wrath, ruining your loyal people at the hands of Rome? Right? We said it's not really, not, I mean, it's Rome, but it doesn't mean just Rome, right? The low is the heart of Rispe, the Tharma, Shibar, Arthur, And how could you not remember your covenant with, 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 with Abraham, who met the challenge of your trials? So, what does that mean? Says the Rub, the Kina mentions all of the covenants with God from, from Abraham to the, to the time of the destruction of the temple and laments that in spite of all the covenants and promises, the Quran took place. He says the author implies that there's a link between Edom and the Brisbane Habitat, that this covenant of peace that God entered with Abraham. The link is found in the statement of the Brisbane Habitat, that the land of Israel is promised to Abraham's descendants. Subsequently, God promises Abraham for in Isaac, ki shall you have descendants. Our sages focus on the word biyitzchak and interpret it as meaning from yitzchak, but not all of yitzchak, right? That the Pasuk says, ki biyitzchak. Let's just, let's just, let's just, I don't know if it's so, so clear, let's just explain for a second that it says, the Pasuk says, ki, that Avram, uh, that Hashem promises Avram that you're going to have, you're going to have descendants, um, you know, it's good. your line is going to continue. Beitzchak. So he's picking up on on that the Gemara. I guess it was a, yeah, he's close to the Gemara. The Gemara's picking up on the word on the extra letter bet that it's coming with from Yitzchak, but not all of Yitzchak. Meaning that not all of Yitzchak's children will be considered Avram's descendants. And so, so he's saying that why why are you making that distinction to to separate from from Yaakov and Esau, that there was a specific promise that Esau, the son of Yitzchak, would not share in the brief Ben nor in the nor in the later prophecies and revelations in which Avram encountered God. Now the king laments this same Esau, right, who you promised us, right, we're saying God, Esau, who you told us, he's the one who's going to be excluded from the covenant, is the very one, right, he's the person, that's Titus, who desecrates the Holy of Holies. How is this turn of events possible? Is this, that's what this Kina is saying, right? You don't remember, we're, we're, we're crying out to God, you don't remember the brief in our you don't remember the, the agreement that you told us, that you said to us, it's, you're, to us, the land is going to go to us, but not, not to Esau. Look what, look what happened. So who met, so, so they challenge, translate this, who met the challenges of your trials. Um, the literal meaning of this phrase can be rendered as the covenant that you clarified to those whom you tested. What God clarified was that from that time forward, he and the Jewish people were partners. Whatever is done to a Jew is considered as if it were done to God. So it states, rise up, O Lord, and may your enemies be scattered. The Medrash, the, 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 the Pasuk, it's a faith, it's, it may be in Hebrew, it will, it will, uh, it will resonate more. It says, um, Kuma Hashem, Stand up, Hashem, and may your enemies be scattered. So Medr says, and Rashi also quotes it, but what does that mean? That Hashem has enemies? Does Hashem have enemies? So the Medr says, no, what the Torah is telling us is that whoever is an enemy of, of, of B'nai Israel is considered as though he's an enemy of the Almighty. And this, this concept was established by the brief B'nai Bitsarim. You know, that's, that's the famous, that's the famous concept from Tehillim, Imo Anochi Bitsara, that the Medr says that you know, that when, when a Jew's in pain, God is in pain. So the Rav is explaining that that happened, right? that, that, you know, that connection between us and God, that when something happens to us, it's as if it happens, happens to God himself, that, that happened with Reis Ben Abitarim, with his agreement with Avram. And the word Leif Chunecha refers to those who were tested by God and passed this test 
that Sovereign this alludes to a statement of our sages that Asa was also given the option to participate in the divine covenant. If he had not sold the right of his firstborn, he'd been entitled to the same destiny which God bestowed upon Jacob. Our sages say that Asa did not want to, com to comply with the contract. The intent is that Asa did not want to enter into a legally binding agreement contained as one of his provisions, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Okay, so, so, and then, and then we say, Zahor Hashem Mehayalon. Remember Hashem, what is happening to us. And the Rav makes the point that, that it says, Mehayalon, what happened to us? That doesn't mean only the Jewish people. It means us and you, you and us, God, because God is also in exile, right? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's gonna be, that's a theme throughout the, the Shkina that it's not just happening to us, but it's also happening to God himself, like you said before. So that's, that's the first line. Um, should we keep going? Next line? Why not? Keep going. Um, the Rav could do six hours. We could do, we could do a, a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, okay. Eicha ga'arta v'gara sa'cha l'galos b'yad g'ayim g'ulacha v'lo z'harta d'liga silu d'erach asher g'alaka l'galacha g'ayim v'barnu v'chor Hashem so then we say, how could you scorn us with your scorn? Exile, exile at the hand of the haughty, those who freed, those who you freed from Egypt and not remember the rapid road you once opened for the banner bearing tribes. And so we speak, remember God, what has happened to us. So the Rabbi says here that how he says, this Kina continues to express the three that God has been directly involved in Jewish tragedy. In traveling in the desert, God did not guide the Jewish people from the distance of his transcendent abode. The Lord went by himself, went before them by day in pillar of crowd, and the mighty himself traveled with the Jewish people because he himself was in slavery with them and was liberated with them. The key is, so, so he's saying here that that's basically right, the same thing which we've mentioned a few times already, that, that God, God went with us when we, when we, uh, you know, he was, you know, he was, you know, he was, he was on our team, you know, he was with us when, when we were traveling in the desert, so how can he abandon us? That's, that's the first point he makes. But then he says further, the king is making another point, which is use of the phrase, the liga dilug derech. You know, that's, that's a little bit of a tongue twister, the liga dilug derech. So what does that mean? So he says, this refers to fitas derech. Right, the word derech, derech, the liga, dilug, derech. He says that means the supernatural shortening of the time of travel that God may implement. When the Jews left Egypt, the journey from, this is the Rashi last week, that when, when, when Bnei Israel left Egypt, so it was supposed to take them 11 days. But Hashem wanted them to get, so he was so excited for them to get there right, that he, he shortened it up for them. He took them only three days. So, so it says the Rebbe, God, however, has forgotten this eagerness and ex exiled his, his people. And the king opposes the challenge. Why have you wrought the separation between the land and its people? This is, below, right, below, this is the word. Below the heart of the Liga Siluk Dera, Asher Dilag to lead Galacha. Why you did? You don't remember how excited you, you used to be for, you remember how excited you were for us to get into Eric Israel now, and now you're not letting us return? You don't remember that? He says there's another possible uh, interpretation of the phrase diluk dera. It may refer to the entire 40 year sojourn of the Jewish people in the desert because God conducted the travels of the Jewish people throughout this period in a miraculous fashion as described by Moshe. Alternatively, diluk dera may be an allusion to the Medrash that says in the night of Pesach, the Jewish people were transported on the wings of Shina from the land of Goshen to Egypt's capital city. Finally, the Python is referencing Another aspect of the Exodus, when the Jews were redeemed from Egypt and traveled through the desert, it was not only a great miracle, but also a testament to the faith of the Jewish people. The prophet says, and, and more famously, maybe in, in a song, thus says the Lord, I remember for you, for your righteousness of your youth, you following me after me in the desert. So God, God told Jeremiah that you always remember the complete faith and trust that Jewish people demonstrated when he told them to leave the civilized country of Egypt and venture into the wilderness. 
then the, the author argues in the kingdom that the face of the Israel during the Exodus should have protected her from the Babylonian Roman exile. So, so that's right, a different way to read it, basically. The Lord the heart says, You don't remember how we just blindly followed you into this wasteland, this desert. You know, that should, that should serve as some merit for us to protect us. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's, this, this last one, I think is, uh, I think is, uh, let's, we'll do, we'll do one more and then we'll stop there. Eicha hagta vehayecha lahadof biyad ha'olim ha'munecha. If the low is a heart of you, vesek, vesek, asher biyad ha'lizidecha v'chein v'konanu z'chor ha'shem na'yelanu. Okay, so first the word. How can you pronounce such words, thrusting your masses into wanton hands and not remember the assembly place you designated for your followers and so we lament, remember God what has happened to him. Okay, so this one, this one requires explanation, maybe requires discussion as well. So the first sentence, I didn't get any help from the rug in this book. So yeah, I'll tell you what I think it means, right? But I could be reading this totally wrong. So that's why, that's why I wanted to finish with this, with this one. So you guys correct me if it doesn't make any sense. So he said, how, how could you pronounce such words? Thrusting your masses into wanton hands. Okay, so to be honest, I looked up the word wanton, wanton. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I mean, I think it means cruel. Um, not the food, not wanton, it means cruel. So, so, um, so, I think what we're saying here, is, right, and then not remember the assembly place you designated for your followers. So I think the, the words, right, the rub that nothing says here, what are the words, right? He says, how can you pronounce such words? So what words are we talking about here? He doesn't mention anything about which, he says, how can you pronounce such words? Which words did, did God pronounce? And then thrusting your masses into once again, so that, that I think is clear that I think that means he, he, you know, that God kind of put us into the hands of cruel people. He put us into the hands of the enemy. So that makes sense. And not remember the assembly place you designated for your followers. So that probably means, right, that probably means that you don't remember, I guess, like this, this, this base of Mikdash or this holy place that he designated for, for us. So we say, right, so we lament, remember Hashem. Remember God, what has happened to us? But wh what are what are the words that that God is pronouncing? So I thought, I thought um, maybe that it could be something along the lines of what, of what we said in last week, last week's parsha in, in Devarim, right? That that when when Bnei Israel after they sin with the Miraglim, um, and then they want to uh, the then then part of Bnei Israel they want to still go to the land. And, and so Shem tells Moshe, tell them, I'm not helping them, right? I'm not, I'm not helping them anymore. They're too late. They already abandoned me. And the words of Hashem is he says, Vamar Talahem. So he says, Hashem tells Moshe, Lo, Lo Talu, Lo Tlachamu. He says, tell them, make sure they know they shouldn't go up to Israel. They shouldn't fight. Ki Aineni Bekir Bechem. Because I'm not. I'm not with them. I'm not, I, I am not with them. So I thought, you know, like if I had to pick words, if I had to pick words that, you know, would, would get us to, in the middle of keynotes to say, God, how could you say this? How could you say, how could you, literally, how could you pronounce such words? I don't know if there are stronger words that you can choose besides for the words, saying, I'm not, I'm not with you anymore. Hashem saying, I'm not with you. So that, that was that was my thoughts. I don't know if that's exactly what was, what what the author of this piece had in mind, but you know, I think I think it makes sense. How could you pronounce such words, and thrust your mass thrust your masses meaning thrust us? So the Rav explains, or t I'll, I'll say it outside, that he says that means like the Sanhedrin, like this. The, how could you how could you put the Sanhedrin into these these cruel wicked hands of people? And then he says, the, the low is the heart of you, Vesek Vesek, Shariat of you, Deha. So he said, the Rav, you know, the Rav says, the word viewed means a rendezvous. So 
I also, um, you know, I heard the word rendezvous before, I wasn't sure what it meant, but you know, it means, according to Google, it means meeting, you know, like a nice, like a, like a stroll, a meeting. You know, I, you know, they say that the, that the Rav um, used to give shir and used to give shir in Yiddish. So, but then, uh, then, then there was some, then there was a guy in the shir who didn't know Yiddish. So he said, so he switched. So he said, okay, I'm going to give shir in English. But the Rav was, the, his mind was so, I don't know what the, the right word to describe it, but, uh, you know, he said, okay, if shares in Yiddish, I mean, so if shares in English now, everything needs to be translated. So he started, so he, so he started using all these English words as opposed to like, you know, some people give shear, it's like half in Hebrew, half in Yiddish, half in English, you know, it's all this one big, uh, big, uh, big mixture. So the Rev, no, the Rev, the Rev was giving shear in, in English, right? He's using all these English words, which, you know, He's got a much more, better vocabulary than all of us. Yeah, that's why it's so, that he's sometimes so hard to understand his, his writings because he was just so sophisticated. And when he said, okay, he had to, he had to read in, uh, he, had, he had to give sheer in English. So he gave sheer in, in English, in proper English. But anyway, he says the word viewed means this rendezvous, this uh, meeting with Hashem. And so he's, he's, he's basically saying here that and there's, so there's some there's some sentences here that, that I underline and I just want to read. Before we before we finish, that he says the definition of a Jew. I'll read this paragraph. Then God's promise. It's God's promise that every Jew has a rendezvous from time to time with Him. Every Jew, no matter how plain or simple, will be able to rise from the level of spiritual greatness that results from God from time to time, bestowing His greatness upon a person. The definition of a Jew says the Rav. It's not what I would have thought because the definition of a Jew. Is a person who experiences this periodic rendezvous with God. There can be no delay in the rendezvous. The Jew does not say that he feels like postponing Tishba for a day. The essence of a Jew is viewed, right? That's how we translate this word in this in this uh, sentence. Rose the heart of viewed vesek vesek. You don't remember this uh, rendezvous that we had. This is what the Torah requires of the Jew. Um, and then he says, um, then he says, viewed vesek vesek. So the word veset means a regular, precise time, an appointment that one cannot ignore. It also has the connotation of repetitiveness, an established pattern or way of life. The Yom Tov is a veset, a special time, which is which endowed with Yusha Sayom, the sanctity of the day. The nature of the veset of Yom Tov is that three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. The mitzvah appearing before God is based in Mikdash. It's a separate apart from the mitzvah to bring a sacrifice. It is rather a rendezvous with God. The Python is saying, right, the author is saying that God did not remember the old rendezvous he kept from time to time when Knesset Shell met with him on festivals. Um, and that's and that's you know, and that's what that's what we're mourning here is the fact that we're not we're not able to have special special meetings, you know, and you know, that that we that we had with that we once had with Hashem. And so we lament. Remember Hashem, what has happened to us? Okay, so that's uh, you know, we got through three lines. There's a lot more, um, and you could spend literally hours, days, going through it. But this is uh, this is a start, and I hope uh, I hope we're encouraged to take some time to look at more of the keynotes um, for Tishabav and also on Tishabav itself. Um, so um, you know, but I guess we should have a. Uh, Hopefully we don't even have tissue because the Mashiach, the Mashiach will come beforehand. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yes,